Welcome to this session, uh, a deeper shade of green. So we'll go deep, really deep in the shades of green. Uh, we want to have a discussion about credible sustainability claims. And really this is building on uh, the session that we had uh, before this. And as mentioned, my name is Karen. I work with the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. Um, I'm very honored to have an excellent panel and Maybe before I introduce my panel speakers, there's just one number that I want to put out there uh, as we begin this session. Up to 70% of greenhouse gas emissions can be reduced through what? The changes in the behavior of our consumers. So really this is about how do we change the behavior of our consumers right from uh, the standards, the legal aspects, and of course, speaking the truth so that consumers make the right decision. So the session today, we will um, talk about the issues, talk about the challenges, but also try and shape the future so that we have that deeper shade of green. So I have four speakers with me, and I have one speaker online, uh, who we are very honored to also have. Um, I'll start right from here. I have Erin Turner, the CEO of Consumer Policy Research Center in Australia. Uh, she flew many hours to get here. Uh, we have Sergio uh, Mujica, the Secretary General of ISO. He also flew many hours all the way from Chile uh, to get here. We have George Lusty um, joining us online, uh, the Senior Director, Competition and Markets Authority of the UK. Um, we have Professor Zororo Muranda, just wave to the crowd, Prof, um, the Chief Executive Officer of Consumer Protection Commission uh, in the Government of Republic of Zimbabwe. And last but definitely not the least, um, Alf Zakel, Head of Division, the Federal Ministry of Nature, Conservation, Nuclear Safety and Consumer Protection in Germany. So this is how we're going to run uh, our panel or our session, uh, one hour. We have uh, what we're calling rapid interventions. I'll give each of my speaker three minutes to respond to a question. And we still welcome uh, people walking in. And then we'll move, we'll open the floor for a few questions. We'll come back to the panel for a more in-depth conversation and then back to you again. Um, I want to start with you, Erin, because you're closest to me here. But um, let's just paint a picture of the needs of the challenges uh, of consumers. What are the challenges that consumers face and what is the ask from consumer organizations? So the problem I see is that even when you want to consume sustainably, it's too hard. You don't have the information you need to compare a product, a service, or a business and put it side by side next to another to understand which one might be overall more sustainable or a better choice. Um, so CPRC in Australia, we're a think tank. We've recently conducted some research into this area to really understand what kind of green information people receiving from businesses. Um, so just last week, we released a report where we looked at 20,000 incidences of social media ads that had green claims. Um, and what we found was that they're just, they're not any good. There's several problems within this. Um, there's an issue where a lot of businesses just aren't providing information. Some categories of products, particularly consumer technology in Australia, mobile phones and laptops, they're just not appearing. They're, they're not making green claims. They're not letting people know about the materials that go into the products or what to do with them when they've reached their end of life. But even more worryingly, we're seeing a lot of poor quality information on the market. Some companies outright lying to their customers. Um, we, we found several examples in our research. But what was much more common were companies that were being accurate, but very selective about what they were telling people about their green credentials, or being very vague and just not useful. Information that doesn't actually tell you what they're doing. So for example, uh, we had one energy company uh, made the claim, same energy, greener company. Greener than what, we don't know, but that's what their advertising to consumers says. Another TV company said, they're for the planet. It means nothing, they get a green halo, but they don't have to actually provide the information to consumers to make genuine decisions and compare options. 
So when we think about the solutions we want, we're thinking about this holistically. What we want is to reach that, that end goal of comparability, to help people make a sustainable choice, the easiest choice around. I think to achieve that, we need to do three things. First, we need laws and regulations to get rid of the bad quality claims. Uh, so this can be things like uh, restricting terms, defining what biode biodegradability or recyclability is, uh, limiting uh, the use of terms that are vague and useless, like eco or natural. But it can also be restrictions on who can make claims. We, we want to see, for example, restrictions on high polluting industries from using green claims. It, there's no way a fossil fuel company can be eco-friendly. They shouldn't be able to put this as a credential anywhere on their advertising. But stopping bad's half the picture. We also need to get good quality information to the hands of consumers. And when I think about what good quality is, it's mandatory, it leads to comparability, and it just it, it helps someone make a decision. It doesn't help a company market their product. Uh, so. We have some examples in Australia that I think work well. Um, energy and water use, we've got a star rating. I'd love to see that extend to, say, repairability and durability and apply to all products where you're making big decisions. That's the stuff that really helps people. And last but definitely not least, we need to make more products sustainable by default. I was here having a discussion about product safety yesterday, and we talk about, you know, we need to just stop obviously harmful products. Um, I'd love to see that extended to obviously harmful environmental impacts. Um, we've got some proposals in Australia where we're trying to get government interest in, say, uh, we'd love to see a law where products need to meet a minimum standard of environmental performance. Uh, I think we've got a long way to go to get that, but it's probably the most important part of the conversation. How does the green choice become the default choice for everyone? Thank you so much, Erin, and I really like your three points. And it sort of takes me to the next uh, question to you, Sergio, about the green maze. And this is really the green maze with standards. Where and how are standards successfully shaping business and policy to uh, policy approaches to uh, green claims? No. Yes, it's definitely a maze, and I'm convinced that a standard can support, can help navigate that mess. Um, two years ago, the UN Secretary General Guterres opened COP26, saying that there is a surplus of confusion and lack of credibility when it comes to claims related to net zero. So there is a, a clear case for standards, and we need to provide clarity to everyone about definitions. So what do we mean when we say net zero or carbon neutral or green that everybody uses? We need to provide clarity when it comes to frameworks for non-financial disclosures. What is it that we have to disclose? We need to provide clarity about the methodologies that we will follow the how, and finally, clarity about conformity assessment, how we will support verification of all of our claims. So there is a very clear for standards, a case for standards here, and ISO can, can help. How? First, with a very clear commitment. We have uh, our strategy 2030. When, when you talk about ISO, you will imagine technical specifications or technical requirements. But in our vision, we talk about people, standards to support people to make their life easier, safer, and better. And we have a very clear commit commitment related to climate change. So what else can we help? First, with our network of 169 members all around the world, Second, with the very strong and impactful portfolio of standards, the most well-known ones are those related to environmental management, the 14,000 family, but so much more about quality management, water management, energy management, and so on. Then standards related to measurement and accounting, and of course, our portfolio of standards about conformity assessment. That's about the what standards. But I think the how is equally relevant, because we manage this network of 169 members, and we create standards working by consensus, in a transparent manner, in an inclusive manner, so 
we make it sure that the civil society and consumer uh, organizations participate in the standard development process, even those who disagree with us will have a voice. And finally, making it sure that developing countries also have uh, a voice. So it, it would be very easy for me to, draw, uh, to draft a new standard in Geneva with three, four experts, and I will give you a new standard in two weeks, but it doesn't work like that. I think it is essential for the value proposition of ISO to follow those core values. Having said so, um, standards are supposed to provide clarity, but we are not quite there yet because there are a number of standard organizations and frameworks that provide overlapping solutions. And we know that because some of them are product specific, sector specific, region specific, and at the end of the day, we are confusing. So it is of the essence that we work with a lot of generosity to harmonize our standards when that's not possible to provide mutual recognition so we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We say there is a good standard provided by that organization or interoperability of our various frameworks. However, that's easy to say. It's very complex to do in reality and it requires to have clarity about the big picture, which is more important than our little individual corner where we are providing our solutions. And the issue is that everybody likes coordination, but nobody likes being coordinated. So that's the challenge we have in front of us, and we are committed to be part of the solution. Thanks, Sajay. I like that point. Everybody loves coordination but no one likes to be coordinated. And I think for standards, you also want to make sure that the process of developing the standards is engaging consumers so that they can understand what these standards are and they feel and they can see themselves in the standards. I want to move to you, George, online. Um, again, still tackling the um, standards and legal aspects. Um, in which situations, and we're talking here about really battling uh, the greenwashing, in which situations are misleading green claims um, successfully removed from the marketplace and where are the enforcement agencies finding it really difficult to hold bad actors to account? And you can call out a bad actor if you want. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I think when it comes to getting misleading green claims taken down, there are three key elements to that. One, I think, is to walk the whole consumer journey and close the information gaps. Second is enforcement. Uh, and lastly, advocacy and international cooperation. I'll try and address all of those as quickly as I can. Um, when it comes to walking the journey, particularly in an area in the UK where we have very kind of badly insulated homes and lots of people are trying to retrofit them at the moment, we as an authority walked the end-to-end -end consumer journey and found it to be really complicated, that the, the certification and standards landscape was not as simple as it could be, that there was greenwashing uh, by businesses and a lack of clear trusted information. And where we've taken action in particular sectors, we've tried to close that information gap, both by setting out the consumer journey that we have identified, but by issuing really clear guidance for business. Business guidance that is incredibly visual, that can be picked up by anyone with a very short amount of time, and they can clearly identify that they may be doing something that's covered by that guidance. And perhaps the best example of that for us is the Green Claims Code uh, that we published in 2021, and that we've supplemented since with guides for shoppers, guides for people trying to insulate their homes and invest in next generation heating systems at home to make sure that fair dealing businesses can stay on the right side of the line. And when they properly invest uh, in reducing the carbon impact of their supply chain, they deserve and can get a competitive edge and that shoppers know what to look out for and understand their rights. None of that is any good, though, unless someone is there to enforce the level playing field. 
and it's why we felt it incredibly important at the CMA to follow through on guidance with direct enforcement action. Um, we have to be fair to us, given warning uh, in each situation before we come. We won't always do that, but here we have. So last year uh, in January, we announced we were looking at the fashion sector and a few months later opened enforcement cases against a large uh, grocery retailer, Asda, and two online businesses, Asos and Boohoo. Uh, and at the start of this year, we announced that we were looking at the far moving consumer goods sector uh, and we'll have more to say on that very shortly um, but lastly in the field of home energy efficiency we again identified issues with the greenwashing of old gas boilers which were being presented as greener than they actually were and we've opened a case now against Worcester Bosch a leading boiler manufacturer in the UK that's so important to show businesses that there is a penalty uh, if they don't uh, comply with uh, consumer law. And lastly, the area of advocacy and international cooperation. As has already been said, uh, there are gaps. Uh, there are gaps particularly when it comes to defined terminology. Uh, we've seen good examples, for instance, in France where legislation can look to close those gaps. Uh, and we think it's pretty important that enforcement is paired by action by uh, governments and that enforcers and consumer advocacy groups could be working jointly to think about areas where there is a lack of clarity and greater consensus will help. And as a group of international enforcers, particularly within the International Consumer Protection Enforcement Network, we're working very closely together and have had joint project work for some time and will continue that. The CMA is very actively involved in that and at the lead of the, uh, the Green Claims work within ICEPEN. And in particular, we want to make sure that businesses can't play enforcers off against each other uh, by pointing to the bar being set at different levels by different countries. If we can agree more as a body of enforcers about what we don't like, that will help make sure we can properly get these claims taken down where they mislead. Thank you so much, George. I think your last point really is ensuring that also across countries, the standards and terminologies really is not uh, is standard um, so that consumers uh, sort of be standardized across countries. Um, I want now to come to my last two speakers and we want to now speak about the truth here. Uh, really, how do you safeguard consumers in a green claims era? I'll start with you, Prof uh, Zororo. How can we make sure companies tell the truth about helping the environment without making things too complicated? I think <clears throat> there are a number of ways in which we can make companies make claims that make sense. For example, uh, we have realized that uh, organizations can actually make compliance checks on companies, uh, particularly organizations uh, that uh, know exactly the kind of compliance checks that uh, are necessary for improving the, the environment. We also think uh, that it's important to, for organizations, particularly you know, uh, consumer organizations, to, to involve themselves in, making, in bringing awareness to companies for the purposes of ensuring that uh, knowledge is widespread. Uh, it's, it doesn't just remain among themselves as a, 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 a consumer organizations. We also think that uh, another way would be to ensure that uh, Verif verification of environmental claims by third parties. Uh, because uh, if you leave it to companies to, 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 to you know, spread their claims, we, in most cases, sometimes you end up with claims that uh, are not telling the truth. So we need uh, verification methods methods that can be assessed uh, at least by other third parties. And of course, uh, we also need to, situations where companies 
can tell the truth about uh, the, the life cycles of their products and what it means to the environment, for example, when a, a product is beyond its life cycle. So in my, in my view, these are some of the issues that we can break forward so that uh, claims do make a lot of sense and can make a difference to, to the environment. Thank you so much, Prof. Zororo. I think your points, especially on verification of methods, methods to verify the claims can help to unpack the truth. Alf, I'll just come to you um, as we wrap up this part. Uh, again, touching on the truth, how can we empower consumers to discern authenticity without, again, or without overwhelming them? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, the, the previous speakers already said, it's, it's very much needed that we have, that we empower consumers and we, that we put a limit to, uh, to green claims. Um, to add some, some figures, um, there was a study of the European Commission on, in 2020 um, that, um, that not only half of the green claims are really substantiated or uh, are misleading or uh, not uh, simply not not true. So there there is a, a huge need for uh, addressing the issue. Uh, let me give you uh, three examples uh, to that on the international level. Um, our ministry is uh, proudly uh, co-leading the consumer information program of the United Nations uh, together with uh, Consumers International and uh, and UNCTAD. And uh, in that program. Um, we addressed the issue already in, in 2016, where we set up a multi-stakeholder process on developing guidelines for providing product sustainability information. And uh, these uh, guidelines were also road tested by, by companies uh, and were added uh, some um, more aspects uh, for, for e-commerce so that they can use uh, in, in that as well. These uh, guidelines have uh, fundamental principles, five fundamental, fundamental principles like reliability, relevance, clarity, transparency, and accessibility, and also aspirational principles, um, so that uh, all the three dimensions of sustainable development has to be uh, addressed uh, multi-channel uh, and innovative should they be. They should uh, use a collaborative approach and also ensure comparability. And uh, these guidelines are internationally recognized uh, in, in several fora, including the United Nations General Assembly. And um, so they also could be used for um, national legislation or regional legislation. Speaking of legislation, there are proposals of the European uh, Commission out there on uh, green claims and empowering consumers, and uh, they are still under negotiation, yes. Um, it's not that easy to define what is a false claim, what is greenwashing, and, and what is a, a true claim. Um, the main aspects of these uh, proposals are that uh, there should be criteria for the use of uh, green claims, so, so the need for some substantiation. For example, no single issue claim, no um, claims on business as usual, and uh, these kind of things. There will be limits to new labels, setting up new labels uh, will be much more difficult. And uh, also there will be limits to green claims like climate neutral, uh, recyclable, and uh, you, you all know that and which are very common. Um, the, the third uh, um, example I want to provide is one of our own government, the, the German government. Uh, we put our heads together um, and uh, try to help the consumers and all, also the, the public procurement officers and, and, and others to, um, to, to uh, get through the label jungle. And uh, we started the process of assessing uh, labels and standards by the government. You can imagine that that is not an easy process, but uh, still uh, uh, we made it, we compared labels, we compared standards, and you can find it on a, on a website which is called siegelklarheit.de. Uh, seal means seal clarity in English, uh, and, and there you can see 
um, comparison of labels in product groups like IT, textiles, detergents, papers, and, uh, and others. Um, uh, beyond all these instruments, our experience shows that it's, uh, the most important thing is to make it easy for the consumer, uh, to have a credible website information tool uh, where they can turn to and uh, where they can find uh, an understandable and relevant uh, in, in information. Um, I stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alf, especially on your last point around ease of accessibility uh, to help in understanding. I now want to turn to the audience. I'll take two quick questions. Uh, if you can keep your question to just one and direct it to a specific speaker, that would be really good. By show of hands, we can start with the lady, yeah, back there. Good morning, I am Dr. Tekla Fitz-Lewis, president of the National Consumer Association of St. Lucia. St. Lucia, a very small island in the Caribbean. Um, to the panel, I do not have the question for a specific speaker. Um, is there any framework or policies that have been developed by any one of your networks that we as a small island can adopt because, of course, being in the Caribbean, a third world country, everything that doesn't meet a standard in the more developed countries are dumped on us. So we're in the process of ensuring that we have the same standards of everywhere, all countries. So is there a framework? Because we realize a new phenomenon, since it is very important for us to eat and stay healthy, because in the Caribbean, we have a very high percentage of diabetes and hypertension. So there is a lot of focus now on healthy eating and people want to eat healthy. Knowing it's a new phenomenon, we get a lot of products saying green, gluten-free, all, all labels organic, and sometimes persons, consumers really do not read. If they see something highlighted on the product saying organic or green, they would just purchase. But for those of us who are more conscious, when we look at the ingredients or the active ingredients, we recognize it is far from green, it is far from organic, it is far from gluten-free. So if there are any frameworks that have been adopted or standards to protect consumers from that, from your countries, it would be very important that you share. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much. I'll take one other question. Very quickly, I'll take it from this side, keep it to a minute. Um, there's a gentleman at the front, yeah. Please keep it short and direct to a specific speaker. Hi, hope you're well. Uh, from, I'm Nelson from Strathmore. Okay, a quick question. Uh, with going green, the product prices will increase and how well do you think the consumers are ready to bear the extra price or the producers willing to burden the, pr the consumers with the extra price? Thank you. Thank you. So I'll just turn to my speakers. Who wants to take question one? Who wants to take the second question? I can take one. Okay. And then I'll come to you, Eric. First of all, most of the Caribbean countries are members of ISO. There is a Caribbean uh, organization for standardization as well. It's called CrossQ. And, and I'm happy to say that the Caribbean countries are active participants in the standard development process, and they are working very hard in implementing them uh, in their real and practical life. We do have a number of standards and frameworks that would uh, support credible claims starting with our 14,000 family on environmental management and also the possibility to uh, verify some of those claims. I hope that can help. Great, thanks. Erin, do you want to also respond and then we'll come to you, Alf? Oh, no, I can. I'll take the second question. Okay, take the second question. Yeah. 
Alf, were you responding to the first question? Um, yes, for the uh, for the framework, um, okay. uh, the the guidelines I, I presented uh, shortly are such a framework. These guidelines for providing um, product sustainability information uh, to consumers with these principles. Um, you can have a look at the, the, the guidelines and see what principles might be fitting for your purpose. But that, that gives you a general idea what is an internationally recognized uh, uh, equality criteria for, um, for green claims for, for consumer information on sustainability. Uh, so for the second question, am I right in that it, it's about uh, how do we get consumers engaged in sustainable purchasing, particularly where uh, it might be more expensive. Um, so something we've been looking at in Australia, I, I know it'll be different in every country, businesses will often create these sustainable products that they they push a lot in, in the marketplace that have big sustainable credentials um, that are more expensive. But when you, you start from a first principle of what's the greener choice, often it's a more affordable choice as well. And I think consumer groups have yeah, a real yeah, role to play yeah, yeah. to, to myth bust yeah. and just help people understand what a genuine green choice is. Sometimes it's not consuming at all, it's not purchasing. Quite often it's purchasing secondhand or it's repairability, being able to use what you have well. Companies often don't have the interest in facilitating that, some do, but I think there's a really important role for consumer organizations to find options and help people understand what's both affordable and sustainable, because I think there's a real sweet spot for us there. At, at least in Australia, I know there's really high demand. Uh, we did some research last year where we found that 45% of all Australians always or often considered sustainability in their purchasing. However, they had real trouble with the quality of information out there to understand what, what is green, what is sustainable. They were confused and they really needed help to make those genuine choices. Um, they had a lot of very low trust in the information companies were issuing. And I think this just comes back to the real importance that the consumer movement has in helping people navigate these essential decisions. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll now move to another session, uh, a panel discussion. We really want to shape the future. And we'll take another 20 minutes or so for this. And I think the first question is really touching on some of the questions, uh, particularly the first question on uh, frameworks. But how can and should claims be substantiated? And I'd want to hear more of regional uh, or continental approaches to uh, you know, substantiating claims. So I'll direct this question to Sergio, and then I'll come to you, Alf. I'll come to you, George, online, and then I'll finish with you, Erin. Sergio, um, you can take a minute, yeah. please. Yes, I can. Uh, three key elements. First, standardized definitions and requirements are of the essence. Number two, verification. So we need to provide clear rules for conformity assessment that are credible and are comparable. And the third one is transparency. And this has been mentioned before. Transparency is not only access to information, but also information that can be easily understood. One thing is ton of data that means nothing, and very different thing is real information that can be navigated through and easily understood. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, um, the, the main uh, issue to, uh, to make it understandable to, to, for the consumer and uh, therefore it should also be, be relevant because the consumer doesn't, doesn't know if this is a relevant information uh, which, is, uh, which is there or uh, if, if it's not relevant for, for this product or if it's just business as usual, that uh, something is uh, sugar-free, which is always sugar-free, uh, but it's, uh, it's highlighted in a, in a green claim. So uh, these are kind of things we have to uh, address and uh, put, a, put a limit to that. Thank you so much. Um, George, we'll come to you. How can and should claims be substantiated? Sorry, we can't hear you, George. Okay, perfect. I hope you can hear me now. Um, we, we've tried to answer this question by putting out a checklist for businesses of the questions they should ask themselves. 
Um, in particular, uh, you know, is the claim that they're making subjective or objective? Is it something that can be measured against evidence? Do they have the appropriate evidence to support the claim? If it's sort of half or hyperbole, they're very unlikely to have particular evidence to support that. But if it's sort of very specific to a claim about an impact on air, soil, water, packaging, components, or production processes, or how a product is used and disposed of, then those are things that should be supported by clear evidence. If it is based on evidence, is that something that's drawing on accepted science or understanding, or is that contested or unproven? Uh, has the evidence been subject to independent scrutiny and is up to date? And does it reflect real world conditions? There's a lot of claims that we see that uh, aren't actually attainable by any ordinary consumer. And lastly, uh, is it publicly available and can consumers actually verify uh, those claims? Thank you. Erin? So I guess I, I come from in a different perspective. I think sometimes substantiation can be a distraction in these debates. I, I don't want companies not to be accurate, but I'm less interested in laws and regulations that help companies substantiate the claims they want to make. And I'm much more interested in laws and frameworks that help us get good quality information in front of people and compare their options. Because if you only focus on substantiation, you end up with a situation like, if I, if I go to the supermarket and I go down the, the laundry liquid aisle, I could see a series of accurate, substantiated claims. I could see that a product is made from recycled materials, that it's gray, another one might be gray water friendly, and another one might be animal cruelty free. But I can put those three side by side and I still don't know which one is overall environmentally best. That is marketing that is working for the company. It is not working for consumers. So I guess I, I, substantiation, it has a role to play, but it's not the main game. The main game has to be getting to comparability and information that works for consumers. Thank you. And I think that really touches on the point, uh, the question that was asked. Uh, you know, the example that she was giving on everything on the shelf is gluten-free, everything is good for diabetes, so how do you, how do you make sure that um, you know, it's actually helping the consumer? I'll now move to the second question, and we're talking about just cutting-edge innovations in sustainability labeling, and what are some of the positive outcomes you've seen uh, for consumers? Um, I'll start with you, Prof uh, Zororo, and then I'll come to you, Alf, on the same question. One minute, please. Yeah, the, there are some innovations that are coming up that really also address uh, the issue of uh, environmental protection. Take, for example, you know, the kind of automation which is taking place in, in the lesser writable, you know, labeling systems. Uh, you'll notice that uh, the advantage comes in the fact that you can actually uh, 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 reuse the contain containers that have uh, just been relabeled and so forth. And uh, there is also the fact that uh, the labeling can be redone because uh, the, the, the technology allows for that which is uh, actually an advantage when you look at the whole system. But also, uh, if you look at it from the consumer's point of view, uh, there is a branding advantage that actually accumulates to the consumers in the end because of the nature of the technology that has gone through and, of course, the fact that uh, we are not now going to try and save the environment by not uh, throwing around these containers and so forth. Thank you. Alf, do you want to respond to the same question, cutting edge innovations? Um, it's very difficult to get an innovation in the field of, uh, no, of, of labeling, uh, because uh, labels are the better, the more known they are. And if they are very new, they are not known. So uh, it's... Uh, it's it's good to to stick to the uh, to to the ones which are already there and which are already uh, used uh, uh, um, uh, by um, 
uh, by companies and, and known to the to the consumer. So it's uh, it's pretty difficult to have innovations in in that field. Thank you. I want to turn to um, Sergio and George. Uh, I just want to hear from you some strategies that are out there or that you know that can unmask or deter greenwashing tactics. Start with you, Sergio. Yes, um, well, standardized and easy to navigate information has already been mentioned, so I will not insist on that. The second one is the role of consumer organizations and consumers to be empowered and ready to, to scrutinize and to uh, help uh, find those who are doing the wrong thing. The third is the role of business. And, and I talk to them very often, and many of them are frustrated because they do strong investment, big effort to do the right thing and to be part of the solutions, and they are put together with those that are doing in greenwashing. So we need to support them to differentiate those who are doing the right thing and with those who are not. Um, yes, uh, I'm sorry. And finally, credible enforcement. So it's not about reputation that should be at risk here. It should make it, we should make it expensive to lie. Thank you. Thank you. George, do you want to respond to the same question? Yes, I mean, in terms of strategies to unmask and, and deter these tactics, I mean, it should be said, I think as Erin said in her introductory remarks, some of these things are just obvious fluff um, and anyone can see that they lack substantiation. What can be more challenging is when you need to get into more detail, both um, from the perspective of understanding what is actually being said about something very technical and detailed. And secondly, from an enforcement agency's perspective, it's actually making sure that you can ascertain that that claim made the difference uh, in someone's purchasing decision. That's how UK consumer law is set up, uh, same for EU. Um, and many other countries have got that same link to a transactional decision. But in practice, as one of the questions from the floor shows, people are weighing price, quality, the green claim, uh, sustainability, biodiversity claims, um, ethical issues in supply chains as well, and trying to work out which one made someone buy something and proving that in court can be challenging. Uh, and uh, uh, strategies that in particular that we're looking at uh, within the CMA are how we can use uh, testing. We can do experiments in particular to try and isolate the impact of the green claim uh, as part of our, our base of evidence that we will ultimately use to persuade a court that the, that the greenwashing has had a, a particularly strong and powerful effect. Uh, and I think that's an area that increasingly enforcers will need to think about and work on together when multiple claims are often being used uh, in parallel on products. Thank you. I'll now turn to Erin and Professor Zororo. You've heard from, uh, you know, George and Sergio on some of the strategies, but from uh, where you sit as consumer organizations, how can you fuel credible green claims, but also ensure that uh, you boost the consumer engagement? I mean, there's so many things we can do here. I, I feel like this is one of the biggest, most important issues we work on at CPRC. Uh, to start, I think one of the most important things is information sharing between the consumer movement. We're often dealing with the same companies or the same kind of behavior. And I, I think it's, it's so important to have conversations like we're having today and that we have with our colleagues across the movement to understand how we're each coming at this issue because we can steal each other's great ideas. So that, that for me is, is the first port of call. Uh, but thinking about you know, what consumer organizations can do, one of the things we've struggled with in our work at CPRC is sometimes it's really hard to verify if a green claim is true or not, uh, as has been touched on by other panelists. There's a lot of work to go into to really understand, is a company making an accurate claim? I think there's great work to do there, and sometimes you can find some really obvious cases, but we've instead 
decided to take the angle of, is the claim useful for consumers? And, and that helps us have a different conversation with regulators and lawmakers. Um, it doesn't matter if, well, it does matter if the claim's accurate. I don't want companies lying to people. But what we really need to get to the heart of is, are people able to genuinely participate in this sustainable economy? Can they use this information and make a genuine green choice? And in so many cases, the answer to that is no. And it helps us then have conversations about the need for law reform, to give our regulators more power. Just, just hearing um, the CMA talk about how difficult it is to take a legal case. We need to be able to have our regulators with more oomph, the ability to, to knock out the really obvious worst practices and to have clear guidance for companies about, beyond guidance actually, clear rules and laws about what they can and cannot say, not just wait to test it in court, which takes a very long period of time. There are a number of ways, I think, which uh, a consumer organization can sue green claims. Now, one way is uh, when the, oh, the companies uh, are selling products which have uh, some uh, a display of the green claims, particularly that uh, showing that the, the, the products they are selling uh, are not hazardous. And uh, also when uh, there is evidence used by, uh, by, by, by the companies to substantiate their, uh, to substantiate their environmental claims. Uh, because uh, sometimes uh, uh, companies tend to, 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 to bring up some exemptions and it becomes very difficult to really tell the truth. So the, the other way is, of, of course, uh, the verification of environmental claims and labeling schemes that can be assessed, you know, scientifically. And you can tell that uh, the, the, the kind of assessment which, we, which has to be done or has been done is, is something which uh, does not leave doubts in people's minds. Thank you so much. Um, and I think I really, really liked uh, hearing from you two around the role that consumers should play, uh, especially in um, you know, getting information that can actually help them to make the right decision. I know we're all consumers of something and sometimes we rely on each other uh, to get that accurate information. It worked for me, it might work for you. Uh, and that's how we move, uh, we move products. Um, we're sort of coming to the end, and I just have one last question to three of my speakers. Um, you know, this was really about shaping the future, and I want to hear from you, Sergio, from you, Ulf, and from George, what lies ahead uh, in terms of, you know, looking at the future? I want to be optimistic. First, hopefully, and harmonize standards that make sense. Number one. Number two, uh, technology and AI uh, supporting the navigation through these all competing frameworks. And a strong uh, civil society and in particular consumer organizations. And you have in my world, in the ISO world, an incredible power. It's not only about using standards, being a standard user. You have the power to be a standard maker in all your countries, through the national standard body, you can propose new standardization items, new standards. You have that power working together with your respective standardization body, and also to participate in existing standardization projects. We need your voice. Thank you. Um, there are two issues uh, I think will lie ahead. First, yes, there will be regulation. That's, uh, that's pretty clear, and uh, we have to do that. Uh, uh, that's, that's also pretty, pretty obvious in, in, in what way and to what extent uh, the future will show, but uh, there has to be regulation and set limits to green claims. Another thing is transparency, and there's also, there are also requirements of transparency, for example, in the European legislation already uh, for the product policy, batteries is the first example, textiles will be the next, and there will be, will be others. And with this transparency, you get the information on 
Where does a product come from? What does it contain? Where was it uh, shipped to and uh, where is it sold? And with all this information, uh, it's no, no miracle to provide uh, um, information on sustainability, even standardized information on sustainability. That will not happen next year, but that might happen in 2030 uh, onwards, and that will make it much easier for the consumer. Thank you. George? I think in terms of what lies ahead, definitely it's taken some time, but I think regulators and enforcers are getting tougher on greenwashing. Um, here in the UK, the Advertising Standards Authority has made it a, a key area of focus. Similarly, our Financial Conduct Authority. And next year, the CMA hopes to operate under new powers that are going through the UK Parliament at the moment, which will allow us to impose direct fines of up to 10% of worldwide turnover for breaches of consumer law, which would include misleading greenwashing. But I think it's also a moment where governments are more directly listening to the voices of consumer enforcement agencies, consumer advocacy groups, and wanting that uh, evidence base, uh, anecdotes, quantitative, qualitative, everything that we can put forward to demonstrate the need for greater consistency on defined terms, more clarity about uh, investment in supply chains and how those should be demonstrated and an evidence base retained. And I think it's a powerful moment for all of us to think about the influence that we have to to make sure that there are better standard sets. And Aaron and I agree completely about it, making sure that it's ultimately usable information that helps the consumer and that they can actually actively use uh, and, and put into practice uh, when, they're, when they're buying products and services. Thank you so much, George. Uh, we have about 10 minutes to the end of our session, but I want to open the floor again. Uh, I'm happy to take three questions. The rules are the same. Keep it short less than uh, a minute question and direct it to a specific uh, speaker if you can and keep it to one question so that two hands, I saw two hands there, none here and there's a third hand. I think I'm going to be relevantly uh, Jay Enchelem uh, from Asim Mauritius. I think I'm going to be relevantly subversive to many of the things that have been said before. Is sustainability itself sustainable as a concept when we have a capitalist society that extracts raw material using energy, you know, and then trying to put forward claims that we are trying to make products that are sustainable. But even these products that you're making that are sustainable, they themselves are using material that you are drawing out, you're extracting. So I think maybe when we look, if you want to correct, all these things are done to correct climate change. And if we want to correct climate change, there is more that should be done for example, CI has got in our consumer rights, right to choice. Right to choice opens out tremendous amount of products and services of choice. So is it relevant to say right to choice or sustainable choice? All right, we use the sustainability approach, sustainable choice. But you will have to bring down the amount of products that is being offered. Would the capitalist society accept that? Would the governments accept that? So that's a big question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a second gentleman at the in a striped Um, my name is Maxine Waite. I work for the Environmental Coalition on Standards. Um, I think we've really had this quite a lot. There's an increase in green claims that are fake. And we should ask ourselves, why is there such an increase? And the real answer is that there is demand for greener products. And where is the demand coming from? It's from the consumers. 
So we really cannot overstate our role as consumer organizations in trying to drive the change into a more positive direction. And because we know better, we have a responsibility to do better. And we cannot like sit down and think somebody else is going to change this. So we have uh, discussed that there are many challenges in terms of substantiating claims. Um, we don't know if they're credible. We don't know the science behind it. And what I'm wondering is that have we considered avenues where we can partner with organizations that have um, sort of insight into these things? Uh, from my organization, what we do, we've worked for over 20 years in standards, in ISO standards, in voluntary sustainability standards. We don't claim to know everything uh, in terms of environmental management. We know quite a lot. But what we've used is avenues of um, collaborating with other people. So it doesn't have to be that you know all the answers. So my question for the consumer organizations, have you thought about banding together to speak with one voice and get your... Um, questions answered from the standard makers, from policy, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, there was just one gentleman who had a very burning question and his hand was up first. Can we just give him a chance? Please keep it short. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Sajeev Nair from Consumer Unity and Society. Uh, um, my question would be brief, but it's very interesting and very useful presentation, but it's very technical. And this is an area where we would need technical expertise. And my question to ISO is that most of the time you work with the standard setting organizations with the private sector. Do you have a program where we can, consumer organization can be capacitated in understanding these key challenges? And I think that would be very important. The secondly, at national level. For, I'm coming from Zambia, where we have only about 60 plus mandatory standards. Most of the green standards, all are, uh, are voluntary standards. And how do we push for those? Because even their capacity to understand these concepts are limited. So how do we work on that? The second Thank aspect is about... Sorry, I have to cut you short. Just <laughs> the second question is about, can consumer organizations addresses greenwashing using the traditional concept of misleading advertisement, misleading claims. That is a traditional way consumer organizations address normal health. But can this green aspect to be addressed? Or okay. do we have examples of doing that? Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. So we'll just be very quick in responding to the questions. I think there's a question to you directly, Sergio, on the ISO. So maybe you could touch on that. And then on to see who else so, wants to respond to Erin. Okay, one of our strategic goals is to have all voices heard, and that is specifically relevant to consumers. So it, we need the voice of consumers, as I said before, and we have a strong capacity building program to support organizational development of our members. So what I propose is to join forces, and I don't know if there is any donor organization in this room, but it's really important to have joint projects, Consumer International and ISO, to support capacity building so our standard can be better used. I might um, kind of combine two of the questions. First, I wanted to recognize the, the first question. I, I completely agree. We do not consume our way out of climate change. Um, and I think this comes to what a really important role for consumer groups is that we've touched on. We can't just talk about buying the more sustainable option. We have to talk about the range of sustainability actions that individual consumers will take, which can be not purchasing. I, I get really excited when we start to get into the space of repairability and durability. And we think when we think about what information people would most use or find useful, figuring out what to do when your product breaks and how to make it last longer, there's a cost saving, there's an environmental benefit. These are all things that I think I, I would love to focus even more on because I can see the value from both a, a savings perspective and a cost of living perspective. Um, and just on that last question about is misleading and deceptive advertising enough? In Australia, our analysis says no. We've had a series of legal cases where our regulators tried to take action on companies using what I think are outrageous misleading green claims, but courts take a really conservative approach to interpretation. Um, 
and I, we think part of that is a, a bit of confusion around what this means, but also an evidence gap around how a consumer is using the information, which is really costly to fill. Consumer organisations very rarely have the ability to do that level of research. It's why we want to see more laws that stop companies making poor quality claims before they even hit the market, rather than identifying the poor quality claims and then trying to show how hard they are and then getting the penalty multiple years later. The damage is already done there. I think laws that stop the harm before it happens are, are much more useful in this space. Thank you. I think we've come to the end. I just want to ask one question to all the speakers in half a minute. What's your one action point uh, taking uh, from this conversation? And I'll start from you, Alf, and then come down this way and finish with George. One action point, half a minute. Um, one action could be the um, assessment of uh, of labeling schemes in the uh, in, in in the country and which are on the market and and, and provide uh, help to the consumers to uh, to figure out which is uh, a, a better one and which is a not so good one. Engagement with your national standard bodies and to actively participate in standardization activities. So far experience has shown, that, uh, shown us that uh, even with the standards that are already there, enforcement makes a lot of difference uh, because uh, Sometimes there are claims that uh, become very difficult to, 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 you know, handle. Particularly when when uh, when people start to suffer, you know. Thank you, Erin. Um, I think I'd probably leave on a point of urgency. I, th I think this work is too important to, to leave for the next 10 years. I think we all have to be working on it now and working not just to stop the poor behaviour from businesses, but to get good quality information out there and make sustainable the default for everyone. Thank you. George? I think a key action is to, is to simplify. Uh, I, I, I heard those sort of points from the floor from the speaker from Mauritius about the kind of the overwhelming nature of sort of consumer choice and what's that pushing. And indeed, we need to massively simplify the range of options, for instance, here in the UK to improve the energy efficiency of our housing stock. It needs to be made really, really simple. But more broadly, I think there's a compelling case for consumer organisations, enforcers and governments to keep on talking together about what we're learning and to make sure that we're as effective as we can be in combating greenwashing. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank the panel once again. Please join me in giving them a good round of applause. Thank you. I'm sure the speakers are still here. You can bring your questions to them. I'm sorry I was brutal with the Q&A, but thank you so much for your engagement and thank you for your time. And I wish you a nice rest of the conference.